welcome to the conversation uh, where we meet each week and we just talk about matters of our faith, matters of our religion. Um, we have these conversations all the time, but sometimes we invite you <laughs> to come along with us yeah. and talk. So uh, today we've invited Pastor Tim Kellerman. Um, he is a district superintendent in the Church of the Nazarene for the Northeast Indiana District. Uh, there are many uh, districts in the Church of the Nazarene, and we'll get into all that stuff um, as we go along. But um, one of the topics for us as we walk through so many things is, okay, so at the bottom of the, the title it says, uh, uh, Southside Church of the Nazarene, brought to you by Church, Southside Church of the Nazarene, Muncie, Indiana. What's a Nazarene? What's a Church of the Nazarene? And uh, we thought we, if we were going to look for a source, uh, we tried all the general superintendents and none of them would come. So we thought, we'll just get the district superintendent and have him come. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. we got to start from the bottom, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and talk about that. So um, we just thought, there are, uh, I guess we'll start here. There's a lot of uh, denominations, and why are there denominations, and what are the differences, mm -hmm. and all the different ways of thinking of things. Um, and I'll say, for me, one of my favorite things about the Church of the Nazarene is that they don't think that they are the one true church. Um, we will really be surprised if in heaven if yeah we yeah. hold to that yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, we don't we don't say you're wrong and we're right mm. if you don't join us you're in a big mess uh, in fact one of the lines from uh, from our denomination is that we may cooperate effectively with other branches of the church of Jesus Christ in advancing God's kingdom yeah um, we're not we're we're weird and we're different but we don't think that everybody has to be like us. Right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And everybody thinks they're weird. Everybody thinks they're special yeah. and different. But, but we have our different... The Bible says we're peculiar people. Right? Peculiar people. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And that's talking about all believers. Yeah, the that's Church that's of that. Jesus Christ right. as, yeah. as a whole, mm -hmm. right? Um, <clears throat> the universal church. So I guess a, a good place to start is... Um, what brought you to the Church of the Nazarene? How did you come about being in the Church of the Nazarene? Well, I think like a lot of people, I was born into it. You know, my, my, my parents were missionaries. I grew up on the mission field. Um, wow, okay. And, and so, uh, so my growing up years um, were in, in Taiwan. And uh, so Na Nazarene is, is in my, my blood from the get-go. And um, so I was born into it. Yeah. You know, then you, you come to a certain time where you decide whether you're going to stay in it. Yeah. And I guess for me, I I never really pondered any other denomination or church. You know, I went to all of that and um, was called into ministry and it was the Church of the Nazarene. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, I, but uh, uniquely, I'm going to go back to your topic about um, we're not the only church and uh, um, uh, ecumenicalism mm -hmm. in on the mission field. That's essential. Yeah. You know, um, we, you find sometimes in in um, we'll say North America. This is a sweeping generalization and may not be true everywhere. I hope it's not. But. We tend to build silos mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the Nazarene Church, and we do our thing. But on the mission field, we we had to have Nazarenes, Baptists, Pentecostals, Episcopals, Lutherans. Um, it took it took everyone with all of our uniquenesses to mm -hmm. to propel the gospel. Yeah. Um, and yes, we had our own Bible school and our own thing, but um, we needed each other. We had. Um, what was this essentially like we have on our district a ministry teen retreat for our pastors? Well, in Taiwan, we, we had a missionary retreat and all denominations came. And uh, so I'm, I, I love the fact that I'm a Nazarene. Yeah. yeah. But I love the fact that it's more than us. And it ought to be. Oh, I agree. I can... Um, 
relate to that as somebody who's been in the military um, and who uh, was a Marine but served on a naval base that also had people from the Army uh, on the naval base. And then because it was a, um, uh, a base that was an airport, basically, we also dealt with um, the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you think of it like, uh, here I was a Marine, but I'm serving on a naval base that had people from the Army. And I like the, in my mind, it helps me connect a little bit with what you were saying about it takes all of us, although Marines are Marines and they're going to tell you we're Marines, <laughs> you know. But um, I, I like that analogy there. It helps me to understand more of what you're talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, with all the groups together, mm -hmm. working in for one cause, and that's to um, serve Jesus Christ and share the gospel. Absolutely. I just wanted that. Well, it reminds me of our conversation about the creeds mm -hmm. and those yeah. initial churches. How that all came about. I mean, we can mm -hmm. we can we can blame Constantine to some degree of his new religion, calling all the guys together and go, okay, now. Nah. Tell me about this thing. <laughs> yeah. How's this really work? Right. But he didn't just say, "Okay, my guys." He said, "Churches throughout yeah. Asia and, and Africa and, and those areas, y'all come and let's discuss what does that mean as a whole." Mm -hmm. And and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I just know based on our study of, of church history, we know that they went back with some of their own ideas still, mm -hmm. but they talked about uh, majoring in the majors. These are the majors. Yeah. These are the things. We believe mm -hmm. in God the Father. We believe in Christ His Son. Yeah. And they walked through all of those. These are the pieces that are His sin. You can have a collar on if you want to, or, mm -hmm. or you, yeah. can, uh, you can do high church with your hat and the incense and the whole deal. Mm -hmm. You can have but yeah. these are the things. Mm -hmm. That we that are most important. that we care about. Yeah. Most. yeah. Um, I came to the Nazarene Church. I think I'm, I'm going to call it kind of lazy. I came to the cat uh, the Nazarene Church because uh, when I was called back to Christ as an adult at 37, uh, this is where my family was. Hmm. So this is where I came. So you can call that blessed, or you can call right. that uh, you can call that the way that God had in mind that this was the crew for me. Um, but this is where I, this is how I came about it. And for us, um, Mary and I come from a background in the Methodist Church. But what the, the, the two things that drew us to the Nazarene Church were number one the openness of love, the the just the desire to you know accept you and mm -hmm. be home and, and welcome home and holiness and the the strive for holiness to be more than what you are and, and be more in Christ um, and and the emphasis is placed on that mm -hmm. and so for us it was, uh, and, and because, I, I truly believe because of being in the, the Nazarene Church, we have grown in who we are mm -hmm. as Christians. So each one of us came different ways, but it all led us to to being here where we are today yeah. as part of the, yeah. the different mm -hmm. uh, areas, part of the Nazarene Church. Mm -hmm. What makes... This is such a broad question, but here it comes. Okay. What What makes the Nazarene Church different? What What are the unique things about the Nazarene Church? Well, I think um, immediately my mind would would focus on our um, emphasis of holiness mm -hmm. and specifically our um, belief and confidence in uh, the uh, the doctrine of entire sanctification mm -hmm. and the um, power through the Holy Spirit that we can have over sin um, that we can live in victory and 
and uh, um, and there you know there there's a spirit of that in all Bible believing churches, mm -hmm. but it, it is so important to, to as in the Church of the Nazarene, it's one of our Articles of Faith, Article Ten, and it emphasizes. This is the way I like to I like to put it. Um, a Nazarene is first and foremost a, a Christian. Mm -hmm. You got to start there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, when I had membership classes with I'm folks, I, I, I remind yeah, <laughs> I reminded them that membership didn't get you into heaven. Oh, exactly. And um, mm -hmm. so it's got to begin with the cross. Uh, but I always say, you know, um, Jesus didn't die on the cross just to take our garbage. Right? Mm -hmm. The sin in our life. Mm -hmm. he, he wants us. He wants a total totally right. consecrated, surrendered, yielded uh, human being that's loving God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, you know, the, the emphasis of holiness and the influence of the Holy Spirit um, is, is such that we believe that God, we can't do any of that in the flesh. I mean, I don't know about you, but loving nope. God with nope. my heart, soul, mm -hmm. mind, and strength um, it cannot happen mm -hmm. in, in Kellerman, mm -hmm. but, but it, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to do that, to live in this life. And you, know, you mentioned love, you know, holiness is often mm -hmm. described as perfect love mm -hmm. to live that out. I think we all can agree that in this day and age, um, we need a little more expression of love from the body of Christ, mm -hmm. you know, whatever Absolutely. it is. And, um, so I think a distinctive, uh, uh, an element of the Church of the Nazarene, of course, um, would be this whole um, uh, idea, experience of being filled with the Spirit as a second definite work of grace. So, you know, you got, you've got um, salvation, and then experientially, you, you come, I think we all come to the place, at least I did, you come to the place that thank God for his saving grace. Mm -hmm. But then you begin to have this stirring that that God wants more, more. than yeah. your junk. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and you sort of transition into an understanding that God is calling us to be all in. And in full surrender, God fills us full with all of him, mm -hmm. you know, so I think that's, um, that's a big deal. No, <laughs> you I, know, I and, agree. That's, and I think that's one of our distinctives. I think when, uh, when someone asks, what's a Nazarene of me, um, if they're a church person, um, I will start by saying we're weird Methodists. Yeah. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I said, well, then you start talking about this holiness movement mm -hmm. in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when... Um, we, the, as Christians, people started to kind of get this attitude of, I'm saved, I've accepted Christ, mm. and I'm just a sinner, and so I'm just going to be a sinner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And nothing I do will have any effect on my salvation one way or the other. But uh, so I can just do whatever I want. I can be a, a, a mafia member. I, I can I can run uh, uh, I can run a gambling joint. I can um, run prostitutes. But I believe in Jesus Christ, and so I'm saved. And I think when we, they went through that period of time, I think the Nazarenes were among several. There were other groups who started in the holiness movement, saying, "Hey, wait a minute, <laughs> that's not." That isn't right. Yeah. You, you can't. That's not. That's not acceptance. And I and I think I like the word. That's not. That's vic when you say it is. You can't have victory. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the I always go back to a smart aleck comment that somebody made. Sometimes sarcasm is the best thing to explain something. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> and they said, when I see your bumper sticker that says, "I'm not perfect." But I'm forgiven. When I see your bumper sticker that says, I'm not perfect, but I'm forgiven, that doesn't smell like victory in Jesus. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, mm -hmm. I, 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 I can just do whatever I want, but I'm forgiven. That's, yeah. not, that's not victory. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah. So when I think of sanctification in that sense, I think it's not saying I'm perfect. It's not saying you're perfect. But it is saying that is we've reached a point in our life where that's what we strive for. Sure. Uh, and we have said to, for me, a sanctification moment was uh, that's it is different than, than salvation. But there does come a point where you're like, I want nothing but you. Lord, I want nothing but you. I yeah. want to do your will all the time. Yeah. Um, and then there is the work of the Holy Spirit. You'll know when it happens. I think anybody who feels that they have been sanctified knows, remembers that moment when um, you stopped hearing what the preacher was talking about. <laughs> or you had that moment when things just went away except yeah. for that moment where it was that you know the Holy Spirit. Yeah. accepted you in that and, and guided you in that, right? Yeah, and I think I think you said something there that is misunderstood. I think a lot of times when people talk, we talk, you, you know, in, in the Church of the Nazarene about perfection. And a lot of people, um, when they question the language, they use mm -hmm. the word perfection, but they, mm -hmm. they, they forget the, the words uh, Christian perfection. Mm -hmm. And it's not perfection of um, human behavior. It's it's a perfection of heart. It's a perfection of motive. I, I want to love God. It's 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 my heart's desire. It's relationship. It's and I think at the end of the day, um, being all in and filled with the Holy Spirit is more about how I relate to God. Um, well, let, let me rephrase it. It begins with how I relate to God right, because go. that will affect how I relate to my, my neighbor. Mm -hmm. You know, it, holiness is intimacy. It's, it, it, comes, it comes all back to a relationship. And um, yes, that's yes, where yes, I want to yes, live. Yes, yes. That's where I want to abide in the presence of, of Jesus, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I'm, I'm not always um, gung-ho about it, but the Holy <laughs> Spirit, you know, there are seasons, right? There are days, yeah, right? And, yeah, yeah. But this fullness of the Spirit, you know, when I, when I get off track, he, he woos me back, you know, it's, it's, it's conviction. And, um, and that, that to me can, I think, be part of the stumbling block for some people when we use the word perfection. Mm -hmm. um, we're not meaning that we've obtained, you know, the highest order of things, at the, mm -hmm. but we are striving toward that continually yeah. in our faith. I always go back to, I always go back to Hebrews. It, it, it is the thing that hits it the most on nail on the head, and it is, he has, he has with one action mm -hmm. made perfect all who are being made holy. Being like, made holy. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Uh, he, he, he did it. It's him. He did it. It's but you're being made holy. Uh, so whenever I get into a fuss, I think one of the things you can get into a fuss as new guy, um, I've been at it for 20 years, but um, new guy compared to some of the older folks is, is that instantaneous moment of perfection. Um, yes, I'm in. <laughs> But I'm being made holy yeah. by Christ. Um, mm -hmm. that, it, to me, that hits it so well. It, you said something of getting off track. Pastor Ron, uh, Ron Gilbert, uh, who was our pastor when we came, when shortly after we came here, and was kind of my mentor. Always said, the person who is sanctified may fall off the track. But they want nothing more than to be on the track. From the mm -hmm. moment they fall off the track, they want nothing more than to be back on the track. And the difference is, I think when we, meanwhile, back at the holiness movement, I think what we were dealing with was there was a time when that wasn't the panic. And I think those people of that day, uh, Phineas Brzee and some of the people who started this church, were like, hey guys, you really got kind of, I hate to say it, lazy about this yeah, thing. Often, you yeah. really kind of, kind of kind of relaxed into that. Well, I'm a sinner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, now wait a minute. No, you're not. That's not who you are. Right. You. Mm -hmm. That isn't who you are. And if that's who you identify as, then that's what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, what is it they say? Uh, a child. 
or your husband, same thing, uh, <laughs> will be will become whatever you identify them as. Yeah. Well, you're just an idiot. Mm-hmm. What'd you do that for, mm-hmm. you idiot? Mm-hmm. Well, you're just evil. Well, you're just so rude. Mm-hmm. If you just keep saying that to them over and over and mm-hmm. over again, then they relax into that. And I think at some point, mm-hmm. Phineas Brzee and many of the people who started this church went, hey, no, that's not who we are. Right. We need to get back to that thing. Um, you come from a family of missionaries. I do. I think one of the more amazing things about the Nazarene church is we didn't start and then create missions. We were missionaries who started a church. Yeah. So many missionaries. We started day one as one of the largest missionary churches already out there. Yeah. In the group. Yeah, that's right. You know, and, and one of the things that I appreciate appreciate about the Church of the Nazarene is our emphasis on on missions, global outreach and global evangelization and making a difference in the world, not just the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation. You know, but but a lot of people won't see Jesus until they see what we do for him, you know, whether it's medicine or food or, you know, wells or whatever it is. And um, so I'm, I'm thankful for a church that, that emphasizes missions and um, makes it a priority. You know, I always told my, my local churches that I pastored, God will bless a missionary-minded church. Um, and this is just um, uh, an opinion of mine, but I believe the churches in uh, USA, Canada, the, the, the West here, would do well to take on a missionary strategy in reaching people for Christ. Because we all know, we all know the come and see mentality of of church mm-hmm. is not effective yeah, exactly. and, and, and you know the, the whole great commission go right um, these are the days um, where you have churches and pastors and you know DS's would understand um, a missionary strategy and go out there uh, and and make a difference in in our communities the difference it would make for, for the Lord and, and I see that strategy as being you know if we follow the example of Jesus he would have compassion on people in whatever form they needed it whether it be a healing to feed them and then he presented You're the, right. the word you know it was we 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 go out, and, and, I, and I like that, and to say that, that we need that in the United States, let's go out and meet the need of who, who's hurting, and who's alone, and who needs, you know, shelter, or who needs clothing, or who needs food. Let's go out and do that first. Yeah. And then, as they, you know, as, as the needs are met, as we have compassion, then we share whatever the word is you know absolutely um, and we've gotten it you, you stated it already but we've gotten it kind of backwards where we want to go out and I don't want to really put anybody down but I am going to use this example we get out and we stand on the street corner and we sure do this and this and there's no relation there there's no mm-hmm. meeting a need there and there's a lot of need in the world today. Handing yeah. somebody a track like, is step 12. Mm-hmm. That's not step one. Right. <laughs> if I hand somebody a track in the Walmart parking lot and they accept it and, and are happy that they got it, they probably already are a believer in Jesus Christ and they think that that's unique and, and sweet and they and they want their, they want the scripture and that's great. They should want that. That's, yay. But if I hand to somebody who is a non-believer a piece of a, mm-hmm. a piece of paper that has a piece of scripture on it, they're not going to get past line one. Jim, mm-hmm. it may happen. I'm sure that there is a parking lot sure. at Walmart salvation moment that exists. Mm-hmm. I'm positive of it because somebody's going to tell me. <laughs> but 
I think it's step twelve. We if we, yeah. if we have if we've sat with them, we loved on them. They know that um, they know that Tim's a, 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 a sweet guy who comes around and is helpful and loves mm-hmm. on them and cares about them. And he was there at their kids' ball game, and he came around when they didn't have groceries, and he loved on them and he cared about them. And now they're starting to try and figure out. <clears throat> You know, I be- I'm starting to believe in this power bigger than me. Mm-hmm. Which one am I going to pick? But Tim Guy talks about this Jesus mm-hmm. thing. That's I true. I can, he is a man of integrity. He is a man I can count on. He is a man that I can hear. You were in the mission field. Did you did you find that to be the most effective? Um, building well, that relationship, meeting that yeah, need, and uh, then keep in mind I was a kid. Yeah. So um, I wasn't really focused on um, at the time uh, how it all happened, but I, but I I can tell you how I remember it happening. Mm-hmm. I remember uh, missionaries gathered on a Sunday night for our missionary meetings, and we'd eat and play games and have a good time. But there would be a devotional time uh, and prayer time, which I totally didn't like. Of course, I wanted, the, you're a kid. I wanted yeah. the food and I wanted to play, yeah. right? But I, I can remember uh, the missionaries praying around the circle and praying for lost people and, and revival and their next effort, a mission effort somewhere in a village somewhere. And um, then going to that village. And whether it was the Jesus uh, film or an evangelistic campaign, whatever it was, it was also associated with um, food or health care mm-hmm. or clothing, you know, those kinds of things. And, um, and, and, and I saw miracles. I saw people healed. I saw saw drunks get sober. I, I saw life change um, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And and as an adult, as a young adult, I began to understand and connect it to, to, to the prayers of the missionaries. Mm-hmm. And then and then how it how that prayer translated into the um, extension of grace. In fact, I was thinking as you guys were talking, um, we'll have to research all of this. Sure. Uh, okay, so, but but um, I think every encounter that Jesus had with someone, he led with grace and followed with truth. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I agree. Woman yep. at the well. Yep. Yes. Um, woman caught in adultery. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyways, I saw my, my, my missionary parents and friends sort of operate in this um in this motif. Mm-hmm. So. That's my, my a research project I'm working on right now. The book idea that I have is this idea that God, people like to think of God as the mighty smiter who no, puts no. it on people. And I, and, I, and I think if we watch him very carefully that he does what you said. And, and, what mm-hmm. and the way I refer to it is he makes them whole first. He establishes their humanity and their creaturehood, their childhood of his, he establishes that first. Now he might be explaining shortly after that that there's going to be, there's fixing to be a butt whooping. <laughs> and, and, and this is just the way that it is. And yeah. I didn't do this to you, you did this to you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, this is, but first he makes them whole. Uh, and I think you're right, you're, you're giving them grace and and then giving them the truth yeah. is just so who they are. Yeah. If people think that you think that they're crummy or they're gross or they're awful, I think there's a chance they might want to come to you because you have a solution to their being gross. But I think if you first establish their humanity and their fellowship with you, yeah. that we're... I think it's one of the things I wrote down. I was going back through um, participating in gri- participating in uh, the means of grace, and it's fellowship. You know, to to be with them first. Mm-hmm. Um, go sit at the mission 
and have lunch with those people. If you serve them lunch, don't just serve them lunch like, I got to give you lunch. Yeah. Be thankful to me because I have given you lunch. Yeah. <laughs> Go out and sit down with them. How you doing? Yeah. What are you doing today? What's your life look like today? Um, establish their humanity. I think the reason a lot of churches are dying is because uh, many of the congregants, all of, all of their close friendships are church Christian folk. Yeah, we and, get in a bubble. And, you know, we get in that mm-hmm. bubble, and I get it. I love my bubble. You know, yeah, I don't yeah. mess with my people, right? Yeah. You know, I, I like this right here, but um, we, we've somehow we've got to figure out ways to get out in the harvest field and mm-hmm. make a difference, and um, it doesn't have to be complicated. Oh. You know, for years um, uh, in pastoring on uh, Thursday, Wednesday, Wednesday and Thursday, mostly Thursdays, I would finish my sermon and I would always go to um, where I was at Panera. And I went there because I got tired of the office. Mm -hmm. But I also went to create and establish relationships. And I got to know the the workers and the people and I'd have prayer with folks. And, you know, I don't think any of them ever came to church. Um, But um, I had some Jesus conversations with folks. And come to your church. Hmm? Then maybe didn't do, maybe they didn't come to your church. Maybe they went somewhere. But they maybe in that evening when things got really really horrible mm-hmm. and you didn't even get to know that things got really really horrible. Mm-hmm. You showed them where you showed them where the dock yeah. was that they could mm-hmm. take their boat to in the storm. You showed them yeah. where that why that weird guy who comes and eats here eats lunch by himself here. But he's got this confidence. He's got this thing. Yeah. He's got this peace that, that he brings with him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're not going to... You're the book they're reading, I guess would be the way I would yeah. put it. Mm-hmm. It's, you may be the only Bible that somebody ever reads. Right. As cliche as yeah. that is, it's, true, though. it's just the truth. They're not going to pick that book up until they they yeah. see it walking. Yeah. yeah. Too many of us are focused on harvesting, though. It's, I, I just tilled my garden here recently, and that's hard. I mean, it's not easy to do, to work in the dirt and get down on your hands and knees. And, but later on, there's going to be a time when all i got to do is reach over and grab a cucumber or grab a zucchini. or It'll be easier then, but the work, people mm-hmm. don't want to... It, 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 even in, in our Christian walk, it, it's always easier to say a few words and lead somebody down the Romans road, you know, real quick, and and then let's convert our kids. Yeah, let's convert our grandkids. Right. Let's right. not mm-hmm. go out, out do somewhere yeah, else. But to get out there and get dirty and get down on your hands and knees is steep. Yeah, that's hard to do. No, but what you were saying is kind of it's that's so connected to that'll preach. Um, to the consumer-based society that we exist yeah. in today. Mm-hmm. We just, I'm going to get on Amazon, here we go, and I'm going to get six of those and three of these. We don't even go to the grocery store and meet people. <laughs> it's like, yeah. We didn't, we don't, don't want to, we don't want to plow it, we don't want to turn the dirt, we don't want to put the seeds in, we don't want to do none of that junk, we just want to get our well, stuff. Well, if you do all that, then you have to go in the house and get cleaned up and take your shoes I off should, and get yeah. a shower, because there's going to be more work. There might be some critter in there that bit me or yeah. whatever. I'm not going to deal with that. We don't have to. Yeah. Instead of just walking out and picking it off. The kids don't mm-hmm. have to go outside and play. They yeah. can sit in the house and play with, I can play with somebody in Texas today. I don't, you don't have to be, I don't have to get out of mm-hmm. here and go do things. We just... So anyway, how does the Nazarene Church do that differently? <laughs> I don't know as the Church of the Nazarene does it differently yeah. than any other church or denomination. Yeah. Um, I think that's that's the call to all of us, regardless of mm-hmm. our uh, uh, affiliation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. I, I'd like to go back and visit the... Uh, we, we talked about like my background's Methodist um, and then we have the Nazarene Church. There's a tie yeah. in John Wesley. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jacobus and, Arminius. Yes. Mm-hmm. So where, what do you see as where we went our way uh, as Nazarenes? Well, I think um, that um, 
our founder, Phineas Eprezi, um, recognized that there was um, a place for people to join uh, a people who had a burden for the down and out the downtrodden and that that was our oh, yeah. that yeah, was I our roots yeah. it, uh, yeah, it wasn't the um, suburbs it, it was the the poor and and so the focus on serving the least of these mm -hmm. empowered by the holy spirit to be able to do more than we could ask think or imagine was mm -hmm. a part of the the journey of the of the Church of the Nazarene and um, and the Holiness movement, you know, Holiness works pretty well in barrenness, and I think the heart of the Church be began there. Mm -hmm. I think that was, and uh, you know, um, this is not what you asked, but I think I think uh, many of our city areas are languishing. Mm -hmm. Because uh, many of us us moved out of the city into the suburbs, mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Thank God for those churches. But there is a a move, a resurgence of people returning to the city, um, and uh, that's that's a pretty cool thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this church went from yeah. dead smack in the middle of. Mm -hmm. um, town out here mm -hmm. um this, yeah, that, yeah that did happen absolutely and i'm not disparaging that no. because there's good things going on but i i i want us to always remember that our roots of the church of the nazarene um was the the, the down and out the hurting the least mm -hmm. of these the poor the hungry i'm going to disparage it a little <laughs> I'm going to say the toughie is when we become a country club, when, and I'm not saying everybody did this, right? But what I am saying is when we got to a point where we were going to church with our friends, and I think we got a lot, some of this, go back and watch Broken Church. Uh, some of this happens when you, when a church becomes more about being with in fellowship, there's nothing wrong and we should be in fellowship with the brothers and sisters who are believers. We need that. We need strength. Yeah. But when we stopped the going into town and or being in town and sitting with people mm -hmm. um, and understanding some of what the, I, I think we lost a lot. There's, there's a, but we're scared. I think I, it's easy to look at them and go, well, why don't you go sit with there? It's scary. It's particularly scary now when you're watching the news and people are being shot and people are being taken advantage of and people, and they were always being shot and being taken advantage of and beat up, but you didn't know it like you know it now. There's an yeah. interesting scene in uh, Jesus' Revolution um, where the people on the board go to the pastor and they say that. Um, we don't need these people here and you know what what are you turning the church into and one guy and, and i and i hear the fear in his voice yeah okay but he says their feet are dirty and and they're going to make our shag carpet dirty <laughs> and what he's really saying is we're afraid mm -hmm. of these new people so the pastor yeah. the very next day which you, you i know you saw the movie <laughs> very next day is at the door washing the feet of everybody yeah, that yeah. comes in. That was a good scene. Yeah, it was great. And and the, the thing that I, I think about with what you're talking about is we, we have a fear of going outside of our brothers and sisters in the church. And we need to get over being afraid because if we truly believe that we are Christians and that God is with us then that doesn't mean that God is just with us when we get together with our our Christian friends 
Yeah, but God is with us wherever we go into whatever certain situation, and there shouldn't be a fear. Right. Yeah. And to be sure, you know, there in, in, in your church and a lot of churches, people do have a an outreach mentality. Thank right. the Lord for them, right? You know, yeah. they yeah. they understand the dynamic of relationship and um, and and all of that. And I think I think some, you know, maybe we just have to disciple people differently. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> and. Um, I don't know, I pray for a burden. You know, I, that's why I think prayer is so critical mm -hmm. in the life of the church because when we pray for lost people with an open heart, God's going to place a burden on us that's heavy. And, um, you know, if you want to lose the burden, stop praying. <laughs> I, I, right? I, I mean, I, I, but, but, but it's in that, it's in the relationship where God begins to to show us with his eyes and his heart and his ears and the burden for lost people will will de develop and I'll I'll just because I'm an honest guy try to be transparent and not fluffy this is an area I really struggle with in in my current assignment because I go from church to church yeah. to church to church I work on um, um, district in district meetings, I am a trustee at a church school. Um, I hang out with uh, other district superintendents of this wonderful church, and my interaction with lost people is has been dim diminished from when I was a pastor, and um, I'm struggling with this oh, because yeah. because I love what I do. I love what I do. It's not that's not the point. The point is, I don't think this job uh, is uh, means that I I lose a burden for lost people. Mm -hmm. So, like, what am I going to do about it? Yeah. And um, uh, my burden is not what it ought to be. I'm just being honest with you. No, for I lost understand. people, I want churches to reach people for the Lord. But my personal burden, and so I'm, I'm praying, and God. Um, Show me, mm. burden me, break my heart for what breaks your heart. But anyways, I went down a rabbit trail there. But this is um, this is real to me. But I know that's important to you because you came here and spoke a while back. Um, I had an opportunity to one of the things I'd like to do during the week is go back and listen mm. to previous sermons, and you mentioned the the. the, the need for prayer yeah. and the need to have a burden for um, meeting folks that we don't normally get to meet with right. you know so I, I know it's strong on your heart mm -hmm. because that's the technically third time I've heard it from you yeah. Yeah. and um, I, I think that's something that we all need to be mm -hmm. striving more for do you you I think you even mentioned that you bring that up to all the churches that you go to. That yes. That you're yeah, that sermon that you listen to that I did on prayers is one that I preach in every every church I've gone mm -hmm. to. My, the first sermon I ever preach is going to do that that sermon mm -hmm. because I believe whether it's the Church of the Nazarene or any church, you know, think about it. Let's just think about us, the Nazarene folk. We've never had more resources, more technology, more, um, did I say strategies, tools, books, mm -hmm. academia, mm -hmm. than ever before. Right. Mm -hmm. But we lack power overall, generally, the, mm. the, the power of the Holy Spirit, um, again, not every church, because I know some churches are on fire, thank God. But I'm talking about as a whole, the local church, regardless of denominational affiliation, lacks the power that God says we could have. And, and I'm reminded all the time, as the resource guy, that our human efforts and strategies have no power in and of themselves. It is mm -hmm. only the power of the Holy Spirit. And we only arrive at that power when God 
God's people humble themselves and pray, seek his face, spend time with him because his power is in, indelibly connected to, to prayer relationship. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I have set my heart, you guys, on reminding all of us, I'll do it at district assembly in a few weeks, that um, prayer is critical. Mm -hmm. If you don't... Personally and, and corporately. Mm -hmm. If you don't reconnect with the power source, mm -hmm. you just run out of power. If you well, yeah. are... It, it, again and again and again, the Bible does this weird thing where it connects what it looks like to be in a relationship with your wife or your husband, that marital relationship, it connects that with what it looks like to be in relationship with God. Yeah. And over and over and over and over and over again. And if you want your marriage relationship in a very human sense, something we can relate to maybe better, to go in the toilet, stop paying attention to her. Mm -hmm. Stop. Stop talking to her over time. Mm -hmm. Stop communicating about what is meaningful to us in this relationship and what we have going on. But at the same we expect to be able to walk through our life and say a quick prayer on Sundays and go home and, and be good. Yeah. But we the same thing's gonna happen. It's just gonna go stale. At some point it goes you you're not connected to the power anymore. Um, and sometimes I think if, as we look in the Old Testament of what happened to the people of Israel so often it was just that they walked away and he at some point went, you know what? I'm going to let you walk away. Do you want to go do that? Right. Enjoy. Let me know how, when, when things get sideways again, let me know and we'll, we'll reconnect <laughs> when you come back to me. Do you think we just walk away? Have forgotten that power? Have we placed emphasis? Oh, I don't know how I'm going to put this. I think we've been made fun of and we have made it ridiculous. I, and I don't mean in a yeah. formal sense. I don't mean in some way. You say a prayer, ha, yeah. ha, 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 ha. but we made spiritual power seem like a magic trick at a show that a that a um, what do they call them? Uh, uh, it's not a cynical person would make fun of. I think mm -hmm. as a society, we've made. Being a good person is a great thing, and you should do it. But I, th I think we've made that the thing that we're striving for. But I, I know among men, um, I'm not going to speak of somebody specifically because I don't want to embarrass people. I know among men that it's, it's almost it's embarrassing. It's below them to stop and say a prayer and to connect and to to stop. Um, we did something at a district um, ministers meeting, one of the one of the accelerate moments when we get together as a as a crew and we learn. And there was a pastor there who was talking about his prayer process. Oh yeah. Through the day. And he said, he said he started out his day with 30 minutes of prayer, of being in prayer for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I think for so many people, the idea of actually stopping, landing the plane, getting out, mm -hmm. and paying attention to the Lord for 30 minutes, and going and getting back in the plane and starting their day again is like, what in the world? And that's the question I asked him was like, can you talk to me from a very prescriptive sense of how that works? Mm -hmm. What does that look like to do that in that day? And that's not his only prayer for the day, but but to start his day in that way. And he walked yeah. through the stuff. And it, mm -hmm. and it was a lot more practical than you would think. I think people, then when you think I'm going to do 30 minutes of prayer, you think I'm just going to like... A rock like a fella at the weeping wall for 30 minutes and do that thing and that might be it right but that was not his prescription right it was very much stopping for a given period of time and maybe even having a piece of paper it's like i'm gonna have a business meeting with the lord this morning mm -hmm. okay lord here we go these are the things i'm dealing with yeah and then pray about each of those things anyway it's a recentering. it's a reconnection mm -hmm. 
that I just think we think is embarrassing and weird. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've shied away from um, what's what's the word? I think we've shied away from the mystical. Yes, maybe, the uh, and the and the the external expression of such. Mm. Now I know there's there there are extremes that you know there's got to be balance, right? Uh, right, um, but. I think, um, for instance, we used to be Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene, yeah. right? And so we, mm-hmm. we eased ourselves away from that because of some of the things some associated stuff. with, yeah. with the, the Pentecostal Church. Yeah. Um, and I think we're sometimes, sometimes, it, it depends on the culture of the church because um, this sounds prescriptive. Um, but I think... Because you can you can you can have the presence and power of God in a high church environment if the focus is on the right thing. Mm-hmm. So I want to say that. But I think because we have split away from Pentecostals and you know what what they the charismatics and what they might represent and how they worship, we, we've sort of deviated away to a more reserved environment. I'm sort of a reserved guy, but I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I think there's some room for expression. I was going to say. For, for being, being free to Every once in a while you just got to cut loose. Yeah, and, um, and I know I'm on dangerous territory because not everyone is expressive, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so much talking about an, a single individual as I am. Mm-hmm a body of people being willing to um, express and share and, and pray. That, I think this is a whole different subject, but I think one of the things the enemy has done to so many of us is, is he, has, he has stolen our voice to pray out loud. Yeah. I don't know how many people I come across. You know, I say, you know, will you pray? I don't pray out loud. Fear. Yeah, and, and that's not saying they're evil or wrong. But, absolutely but not. They are, again, just, we're back to being scared. Yes, it's, it's a fear something thing. Something has happened mm-hmm. where we're afraid of yeah. being um, made fun of or being thought of differently. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoy listening to this fella on who's a sportscaster guy. And he said one time, if somebody stands up or sits at, at lunch or a gathering that we're going to be in and they say, hey, fellas, can I pray for us? He said, all he's doing is making himself important. That's all it's about. I'm leaving. Mm-hmm. I'm just. I'm telling you right now. When that happens, I leave. And I went. That's so sad. Yeah. That that. I mean, I understand. Maybe he's around the wrong dude. But. But that's happened to the. To, mm-hmm. We've gotten to a point yeah. where we're gonna make fun of that guy um, if he did that. So yeah. Mm-hmm. So, meanwhile, back. What's a Nazarene? <laughs> All of these things. We're All of these about. things, <laughs> absolutely. But what? But um, sacraments. The Church of the Nazarene and sacraments. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's funny the things that you would think of as a maybe you might think of as a sacrament or something that is a that that shows us to God, connects us to God, is holy in that moment. Mm-hmm. The other churches consider a sacrament, but the Set Nazarenes don't consider a sacrament. But I also think that if you looked at somebody and said, is that holy, and is it a moment when we connect mm-hmm. with God, they would go, well, yes. <laughs> yeah. So for the Nazarene church, there are two sacraments, yeah. uh, baptism and communion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Those are the sacraments. Um, and so when we talk about... Um, One of the distinctions for me, I was amazed as a new Nazarene, was that you can go into a Nazarene church, and it can be um, say there's uh, there's a difference between going to a Cincinnati Reds game mm-hmm. and going to a Steelers game. Yes, there is. <laughs> when you go to the Cincinnati Reds games, we all go with them, uh, charge at the same time, and it's all scripted and we do what we're supposed to do <laughs> and we're very mm-hmm. together so there are Nazarene churches that I will say are very Cincinnati Reds churches okay. we're yeah. doing our thing when it's very prescribed and we do what mm-hmm. we're supposed to do 
And then there are Steelers fans' churches. There are wave a towel, yeah. walk the halls, um, and 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 I love that. I love that we can have that Absolutely. expression within this same church. But also one of those things is the sacraments. There are churches where um, Davy wants to get sac- Davy wants to get baptized. Mm-hmm. We're walking to the pond out back. We're doing this thing. Yeah. And there are churches where once a quarter, on the third Tuesday, right. mm-hmm. we do baptisms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there are churches, uh, Southside Church of the Nazarene is one of them, for example, where we do communion every week. Yeah. We have communion every week. Mm-hmm. And then there are churches that feel like there are Nazarene churches that feel like that's too Catholic. We're gonna do, <laughs> we're gonna do communion, and I laugh. I've exposed my I've exposed my bigotry um, <laughs> when I laugh, but but. When they say it's too Catholic, I'm like, seriously? Um, but that's the thing they do once a month. Mm-hmm. That's the thing they do once a quarter. It's the thing mm-hmm. they do on Easter. It's. But the Nazarene church as a whole doesn't say, you have to do baptisms on this period of time. Right. They also don't say, um, I'm doing all the talking instead of doing some listening, and they need to do some listening. But when we talk about the... Un- the freedom in baptism in the Nazarene Church. Mm-hmm. We can baptize in pretty much all the ways, right? Yeah. As a Nazarene Pouring, church. sprinkling, immersion. Mm-hmm. All of them. I've already. done it with a bucket. Yeah. yeah. I guess that's pouring, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I will stop it at um, water guns. I've seen that. I, don't, I think I don't think we would think that was probably no, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> Reverent. I would for not. The <laughs> I would not. So all the ways except squirt guns, I would say. Probably. But it, it's the idea behind a sacrament. What I'll, when you think of a sacrament, what do you think of? When we think of the sacrament of baptism, what are you thinking of from a, from our perspective as a church? Well, I, I guess I think of it in the way it's intended. If this is the answer to your question, I, I think it it is simply a a um, public confession, um, announcement, declaration of a decision to follow Christ. Yeah. I wasn't trying to pigeonhole you. No, I'm, I'm just saying. I'm there's a lot of ways of thinking of that. Mm-hmm. Of that, right? I mean, mm-hmm. and I think we think of it as a church, the same way we think of communion, in that I've been to Nazarene churches where we took communion out of the pre, pre-prepared little thing of, of juice with, yep. with a wafer on top, and, and that I would say is the Cincinnati Reds version. <laughs> the very, this is mm-hmm. the way we do it. Mm-hmm. And I've gone to places where it's in tinction. Uh, we, we've done all the ways here mm-hmm. in tinction where somebody's holding yeah. the juice and you, you dunk a piece of bread you take it back to your chair mm-hmm. uh, I've done we, uh, one of my favorite moments of intinction just a little humor um, had a, a, a very 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 old lady who was really having trouble with even dealing with but by golly she got up out of her chair and she came to the front and she took a piece of bread and she popped it in her mouth and grabbed the glass and took a drink and I went <laughs> I'm in. This is good. And then the next person behind her, nobody skipped a beat. They didn't stop. Well, that that cup is nasty. Yeah. One of the things that, yeah. that I've enjoyed about the Nazarene Church is the freedom for each church to express its identity, uh, because at, we know every church has it has its own identity. There's a just do. there's a picture of what you have. At, this, this church is this, this church is that, this is the feel that you have, you know, there. Mm-hmm. And in the Nazarene church, uh, the, the, the church as a whole, each local body is free to express within the guidelines of the sure. magic, but free to express itself for who it is. You may walk into one Nazarene church and the pastor's there in a three-piece suit and you know everybody's looking good and but then you may go to another Nazarene church that's obvious Nazarene <laughs> but the pastor may be show up in um, a flannel shirt and a pair of blue jeans and and preach like that. I, I've enjoyed 
knowing that there's a freedom to be Absolutely. who you are as not only a person but as a body. I'm sure as a district superintendent you see yeah. a lot more of that than we do. You reckon you see the yeah. the extremes Absolutely. of each of those things. Absolutely. And you know, everywhere I go, um, it's it's really a beauty to behold mm -hmm. because it it's just descriptive of one of the distinct distinctives of, of our church and and that is um, everyone every church has its own personality mm -hmm. so yeah I've seen the suits I've seen the skinny jeans and t-shirts I've seen the casual um, and um, it's awesome yeah. you know it's every awesome. disciple wasn't the same no you know they were they all had their personalities they all had the things that they brought yeah. in their teachings and to the places that they ministered I, I think of it like spices hmm. um, different spices add different flavors and thankfully so yeah and the differences in the freedom that the Nazarene church has to express itself mm -hmm. in the local churches is just like a different spice it mm -hmm. adds flavor. You can still take a piece of meat, chicken, and add a different spice to it. It's still chicken, but it's going to taste it a little different. Yeah. Uh, and I and I see that with the Nazarene Church, and I like that with the Nazarene Church that uh, you can go and have that freedom to express being a Nazarene, but being an individual. Mm -hmm. It's kind That's of so true. Cool. Thing. So. Right quick, just kind of get to the business. I want to kind of get to some of the business of it because we kind of need to land the plane. But um, when we think of the Nazarene Church, I think we've talked about many of the distinctives. I think some of the, the business, the boring side of it would be you're a district superintendent. So what in the world is that all about? You're like the local pope? No. But the, <laughs> can we talk about the fact that the Church of the Nazarene is, is unique to me in the fact that they're both Episcopal, centrally run, and congregational. The, the congregations, which comes back to the uniqueness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Each church is its own kind of spirit and its way of working mm -hmm. through things. Um, how do we get a district superintendent? Why do we have somewhere between five and twelve popes? And... <laughs> Don't hurt me. Um, uh, and, you know, I think when people think of the government governing of the church, yeah. I think people look at it and wouldn't understand. I mean, I joke we have somewhere between five and twelve popes. But people don't understand this concept of a general superintendent. They don't understand the concept of a district superintendent. They don't understand what it means to be both congregational and yet have a central mm -hmm. office. Um, to have a manual that, mm -hmm. that we, we have, and if you're looking, if you're looking for the the really boring down to the brass tacks of it part, um, somebody's going to slap me for saying it's boring too, but I'm good with that. If you go to 2017.manual.nazarene.org. I'm going to bet you that most people don't carry the book around anymore. They can get, you can get it online. They have both the electronic version, which is what I use, uh, that'll let you use your phone or your web browser and just click through it, find what you're looking for, uh, or the PDF. You can download yeah. the PDF if you feel like doing that, or you can even go to Amazon and get the manual. But the manual for us is what? Well, it's it's our um, guide. It's, it's our constitution, um, our um, um, distinct distinctives, it's our government. It, it literally guides everything we do from um, um, an institutional perspective. Yeah, so, I, so, I like that. So that, um, so that all of us are are encompassed by the same system of mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I always tell pastors and boards that the manual is our friend. Absolutely. You can you can 
decry the manual, and it's you know it's a thick book, and uh, um, it's just a bunch of government, you know, man hog, rules, whatever. trying yeah, to put a man in my place, but, and, and and so it is. But um, we can't operate with without them. Um, but I t- but, but it's our, it's our friend because if if we stay within the framework, then we have a covering. Yeah. Denominationally, not a not a you know it's not the Bible, right? No. Nope. So it's, it's not, not a, the Book of It's not a God no. covering. It's it's we, we have a a cle- ecclesial covering um, uh, that that protects all of us and um, describes how everything works and uh, the steps that you take. And we, you know, the church is 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 the the bride of Christ. It's it's in that sense. It's spiritual, mm-hmm. but we're also human. Yep. And uh, yep. we we've got to have it. And uh, um, so, anyways, teasing about popes and yeah. potentates and rulers. I think I also I, I, um, you're going to be nice and not come at me for that. So then I'm going to have to actually explain what I'm talking about. One of the things that people won't understand, uh, need to understand from a church perspective, and again, one of the things I love about the Church of the Nazarene mm-hmm. is we are, in a sense, a, a, um, a representative government. So mm-hmm. um, when people think of a representative government, it's really easy to look at the United States and go, representative government, yeah. right? So in the same sense, from, from a Nazarene church perspective, we have local elections in the church well, why do you have an election in the church? It's just Jesus, and he's in charge, right? Okay, but here's the deal. People put money in the collection plate so that we can help our missionaries, so we can actually pay for the lights, so we can keep a roof on the building. Somebody's got to handle that checkbook when the when the money comes in. Yeah. We're not going to just go, hey, let's all get together on Tuesday and decide that. We're probably going to elect a treasurer. It's a human institution, to your point, right? It's spiritual. And it's, mm-hmm. So we have elections. We elect board members to guide us and help us decide whether we're going to fix the. These are the simple things. You well, and well, need do this. to decide. Let me do this in layman's terms, real quick. Okay. Yeah. Without all the. We are in a day and age when you have to have a uh, business plan because there are things in the church today that need a business. If you own they a building, you've got to take care of business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All this does is tells us how to take care of business exactly like you said from a human being standpoint. It is not a spiritual guide, it's a guide for the thing. Now, although it does tell us certain steps that we can take and do to move on in our faith to become leaders in the church, but basically what this is, is it tells us how to handle the day-to-day aspects. That's in there. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm, it is in there, but from a from a government perspective, we elect a local we elect sure. a local board that a lo- local sure. board elects representatives to the district, and the district those people elect a district board yeah. who hires um, a district superintendent. Yeah. But then we elect a general board, which elects which then we then we have general superintendents that mm-hmm. that happen in our general assemblies, our right. district mm-hmm. assemblies. Mm-hmm. So it's very much like having a representative government of, of the United States, mm-hmm. um, in that we do have representatives that go to these yeah. things and, and help us to stay in alignment with each other. Right. The the difference yeah um you're absolutely correct. I have no problem with, with that whatsoever, but but in the church, there's sort of this sidecar you've always got to remember. Yep. Um, you know, in our country, um, you know, by the people, for the people, of the people. Mm-hmm. And um, almost mm. uh, almost every election I would have, local election as a pastor, I would, I would tell them this. This is not a popular popularity contest. Um, this is not a... This is not a democracy we're getting ready to exercise. This is a theocracy. God is the head of this the church. This is an unashamed theocracy. The, yes. the, this, yeah, yeah. This, this, this is the body of Christ tuning in to the head of the church who is going to instruct us who he wants 
to represent him mm-hmm. in the coming year. Yeah. You know, and I know in my mind that um, people are going to vote for those that they, you know, that, that's all, yep. that's all, yep, yep, all yep, good yep, and well. Yep, but, yep. And, and then, and then I, I always would tell my boards and my churches that, yes, you, re- you represent um, the congregation. They should speak into you if, if, if I'm not hearing and you, you will help us. But at, at the end of the day, our ear has to be tuned into God because um, at some point, uh, it, er, the people will drop off and we'll, we will represent him. You know, so there, there is the side of a representative form of government um, in the church, uh, but there is the other side and the big holy task of representing um, God. And there are going to be times, and I've been in those board meetings as a senior pastor, when we have to do what God wants, not do what Mm -hmm. the people in the church want. There are times Mm -hmm. when we have to put on our big boy pants and go, we have prayed about this thing and it just keeps coming back that this is what we need to be doing Mm -hmm. as a crew. Um, and we may come back next weekend with a third of the church <laughs> it walked out, but but it'll work out if we do what God says. Yeah, I think this the is a the theocracy. Day, yeah. In the yeah. I think it's a very good way of putting it. This is a theocracy. In the and I and and to to bring home the point, you can't live in that realm like as a board or a church unless you are regularly. Um, in a posture of prayer. Oh, this praying thing. Whatever. Uh, sorry. You just keep no. going back to that. And it's not a bad word to you. <laughs> the only thing I would say, the, the thing I wanted to say about this being the human side is one of the things that I, going back to it, as we, as, as we came back to this, one of the things that I did go back to reading it was there is there is very much a spiritual side sure. of this. Um, it isn't it isn't a replacement of the Bible. Every spiritual mm-hmm. thing this says literally has chapter and verse underneath it. This, yeah. this is where we got. This yeah. is how we got there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it walks through. You would I, I would I would think anybody who read parts of this who started down through like the Constitution would walk through and see. It is very much like the Nicene Creed. It's very. It, it walks through. We believe yeah. in God the Father, and, and, and it walks through all of those pieces. It, it may be a little more wordy because it's trying to talk about the unique position that we have on those things, and all of that is here. Mm-hmm. Um, it is also. Um, it, it talks about the the ooky stuff that maybe we don't want to talk about out loud in some of these situations. It talks about human sexuality, and our position on that. It, it does talk about those things. Um, and that's a can of worms I'm not going to open up all the way at this point mm-hmm. because I don't think we have... That's a whole other hour. I think, or two. Or two or twelve. <laughs> um, when we talk about human sexuality, particularly in today. Um, but it talks about those things. Yeah. Those things mm-hmm. are covered. Why is this... Why does this cover it when we could just say the Bible covers it? What do you think? Well, I think I think that the answer to that question would. This is how I would answer it. I think um, when it comes to the Articles of Faith and the, say the Covenant of Christian Character and Conduct, um, a church, whether it's an a independent, non-denominational, or denominational church, mm-hmm. there will be people who will want to know what does that mean mm-hmm. for us, yeah. for my church, yeah. for my family, for me personally. And again, every every denomination um, will have their own perspective. And, yes. uh, and so the, the, the manual um, helps explain what we believe the scripture is saying on certain topics yeah. and and what it's not saying on yeah. certain topics and we'll specifically say we don't mm-hmm. we're not we're not dealing with yeah. this because it ain't there yeah here's here's a, an example um i'll pull out the example um in our conduct character um category that is in in the realm of uh drinking 
drinking alcohol. Yeah. So we all know, don't we, that the Bible does not prohibit drinking. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, don't get drunk. That's that's what the Bible says. Yep. So, you know, I've had people say, well, the Bible doesn't say you can't drink. And I said, you're, you're exactly right. Um, but one of the reasons that that perspective is in the manual is because uh, the initial roots of our church uh, dealt with the poor and the downtrodden and those who were consumed with addictions, mm-hmm. alcohol, whatever. And we, the Church of the Nazarene, chose to be a place where we were public about our abstinence, a safe place where people could go and and be discipled and and um and you know it's it's like it's like going to your AA meeting it's a safe place and so the church of the nazarene just became a place where folks could go and worship who believe that it's best not to drink for the sake of soul for mm-hmm. the sake of community for the sake of your your family and so you know um, the the issue of, of alcohol use and all of the woes of, of it um, is where the Church of Nazarene lands because we just feel like we'd all be better if that wasn't a part of the equation yeah. um, but it's also very good in the fact that it doesn't say as in, the, in, it doesn't say it's a sin. Correct. Drink. It never yes. says that. No, it does not. Correct. And there are those that do, and I think they land in a really rough place. Correct. When they, when they try to play that, and I yeah. think that it's very. I appreciate its frankness in the way that it deals yeah. with it. It's mm. um, now I know that that's morphed a lot and may as yeah, we go, true. but I will say one of the things that it it, it, it just explains it, we abstain. Mm-hmm. We choose to abstain yeah. but the reason we choose to do that is because of well there's just so much junk now in fact I listened yeah. to a guy yesterday I listened to all these podcasts Matthew Huberman uh, who is a um, neurobiologist talking about the fact that uh, he tells people he was speaking to a fellow about how to improve his life his health having all these health troubles and one of the things he told him was um, I'm not picking on you if you drink I'm not picking on you about it I'm not saying I'm just saying if you can stop that, there are all of these tests or all of these studies that show that it's just not good for you. Yeah. That you're better off if you just don't. Yeah, sure. If you just mm-hmm. don't. And, and I, so I'm not, I'm not giving you grief. Nope. I'm not saying you're a bad person. Mm-hmm. I'm just telling you if you can abstain. And this is from a secular perspective. Mm-hmm. But it, what's weird is then I read this, going back through some of this stuff, and one of the things it basically says is with all we know now, about what it does to you physically. I'm like, yeah. they added that when they found that out because that's good stuff. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, there's so many things that are in there that we could just spend days on, but I mm-hmm. I wanted to get your perspective mm-hmm. on what it means to be. We're going to talk about what it means to be a Nazarene. Mm-hmm. I love that you were willing to come and do this. My mm-hmm. pleasure. I know that you have we only a scratched the surface. Yeah. Yeah. No, we absolutely did. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe I can convince you to come back sometime. I'll be happy to. But um, thank you. For coming and doing oh, this for us, very, very um, for and uh, uh, thanks for putting up with this. I know uh, Pastor Tim goes and visits all of his churches, and so he just visited one of he just visited one of his churches again <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> by coming yeah. to the e gathering Church right. of the Nazarene. Um, and we appreciate you guys coming and visiting with us. Um, thank you guys. You have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye. See you now.